Well, I decided to use the same play from my playbook that I've used before and have the external awardee who was receiving this year's NHGRI Special Recognition Award also be the keynote feature for today's great ceremony. And for this, I'm delighted to honor Mona Miller, the CEO of the American Society of Human Genetics. Now, by way of background, uh, most NIH institutes interact with multiple professional societies and patient advocacy groups. Uh, the nature of those relationships can be, uh, shall we say, mixed at times, in some cases being quite positive, uh, while in other cases being associated with some challenging interactions. But you know, not being associated with a specific disease area means that NHGRI really is not aligned with any advocacy groups that are unique to a particular disease area. And rather, we have excellent relationships with several professional societies, specifically those associated with human geneticists, medical geneticists, and genetic counselors. Now, the most significant of these relationships is with the American Society of Human Genetics, or ASHG. Simply stated, many of the staff of NHGRI are members of ASHG, and over the years, many NHGRI leaders have served on ASHG's board and or major NHGRI, ASHG leadership positions. But most importantly, ASHG and his staff have become great colleagues and friends to the Institute, particularly in recent years. This has included not only very positive interactions around areas of mutual interest, but also major collaborations and close coordination on a number of areas. Now, a major reason for this recent positive growth in our relationship with ASHG relates to its CEO, Mona Miller. Upon taking the reins of ASHG six years ago, Mona has been nothing short of spectacular at leading the society and developing even stronger bridges in area of collaboration with the Institute. From day one in her role as ASHG CEO, I and multiple others at NHGRI developed strong mutual admiration for Mona and her efforts to advance ASHG's mission for its members and more broadly for the fields of genetics and genomics. This included a number of programmatic priority areas of major importance. It also included each organization helping the other in developing the latest versions of our respective strategic visions. And most importantly, we greatly expanded our joint fellowship program, extending it beyond the existing fellowships in policy and education to include a third in communications and a fourth for post-baccalaureate trainees. Together, the new suite of four joint ASHG and HGRI fellowship programs is in its inaugural year and will now include 10 fellows per year instead of the previous two. I cannot tell you how excited I and others at NHGRI are with respect to this new joint ASHG and HGRI fellowship program. But Mona's contributions go well beyond our relationship between the two organizations to include a major set of advances that the society has achieved under her stewardship. This includes making the society a more professionally organized entity, increasing ASG, ASHG's focus and programmatic efforts related to enhancing diversity, navigating the society in its, ma in its major annual meeting during the difficult times associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, and having the society confront its history with eugenics. And all of this was led by someone who was not formally trained in genetics, but who, as you will learn, has great instincts and judgment, as well as a style that is amazingly effective. Now, my giving Mona Miller this year's NHGRI Special Recognition Award actually has a bittersweet aspect to it. Mona and I had a Zoom meeting a couple of months ago during which I plan to tell her about this award and invite her to today's great ceremony. But before I could give her this good news, she informed me that she had decided to step down as CEO of ASHG. But let me emphasize, and I really do, that this, my decision to give this award came many weeks before I had any idea that she was leaving ASHG. This honor has nothing to do with her departure. And in fact, I thought that this award would mark something like the halfway or halftime of Mona's tenure as ASHG CEO. But in another twist of irony, that wasn't the case. And it really is sort of a, um, bittersweet that today is actually her last day at ASHG. And here she is spending the afternoon on her last day with us at our great ceremony. So I would like to ask Mona Miller to please join me up higher on stage so that we can use a fireside chat format 
to have the greater NHGRI family learn more about this wonderful friend and colleague of the Institute. So please join me in a round of applause for this year's NHGRI Special Recognition Awardee, Mona Miller. Congrats. Thank you. Here, sit here. All right. So thanks for coming. Thanks for everything you've done. And, um, and I hope you're still my friend at the end of this. No, you, you will be. I didn't know if I should bring a heat shield for yeah. the fireside chat. Or... Yeah, well, somebody told me they were going to try to have you look at last year's fireside chat with Larry Tabak, and I'm glad that didn't work out because that was a bit more of a roast. But um, so I want to I want to sort of march through some just general areas so that people the whole bowl here so people can get to know you and take a little tour through your head. Um, so let's just start with your life journey. So I know you, you grew up in Northern California. Mm -hmm. You decided to go to college at Tulane yes. in New Orleans. And then you decided to get a master's degree in public policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Did you have any interest in science along that way? Uh, not at the time. My early interests, I've, I think I've always considered myself an advocate. It was really trying to find something that I felt like I could really um, uh, get as excited and passionate about as um, a career path. And I found my way to science in, um, in an unusual kind of way. Uh, my early advocacy was really in women's health. Um, my early years at uh, the National Planned Parenthood operation uh, organization during the 90s, when uh, I, where I really learned the, the core elements of advocacy. Um, but I became a science advocate, really thanks to Senator Barbara Mikulski, for whom I worked um, in the late 90s, um, and who was a great, great champion of this institution and so many other institutions in Maryland. Um, she really saw science not just as, not only as a means to uh, health end um, or a science or a space end or um, uh, any number of the other um, science programs that are led out of Maryland. Um, but I think as a scientific quest, I think she saw it as something larger um, for humanity's sake. And so I came as a health advocate and I left as really a lifelong science advocate. And it's been such a pleasure to get to know different elements of the scientific agenda for the US and to do it most recently for human genomics. So was, was, that, your first, was that your first job, was with the senator? Uh, no, my very first job was, um, uh, I dabbled in um, journalism. Uh, coming the question, down to the master's, you coming, uh, No, so oh. I um, went to Tulane, uh, moved to New York. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Started um, at, at Planned Parenthood. Oh. Um, there and did uh, some work there, moved to DC, very involved in policy and, and advocacy um, in Washington for a few years. And that's when I went back to grad school. And then coming out of graduate school. I went to Senator Mikulski's office. Did you start off as her communications director or you worked yes, your way up? communications director. Well, that's a big job for a high profile senator. Um, it w I had gotten to know Maryland um, uh, politics a little bit through some campaign work um, earlier in my, in my uh, tenure or my career. And so it was um, a really natural and exciting um, role to take. And have you been in the DC area ever since? Yes, except yeah. for the quick trip to Boston for grad school. I've been yep. in DC ever since. Ever since. So we've, and so you, you made a point, you pointed out your family. So you want to introduce the family members who are here with you and then tell us sure. about your family and how that got woven into the different stages of your career. Well, um, my husband, Brian Romer, and my daughter, Willa Romer, are here. My son, Lucas Romer, is not here. He's a junior at University of Vermont um, studying environmental studies and um, what's his latest major? History. Um, <laughs> And, um, and so they are really um, the best part of my life. And I got to know Brian. Uh, I met him in policy school. He too has um, a real commitment to making the world a better place. Um, he still, he does that as an attorney, believe it. Um, he really does. And um, so they've, um, you know, just 
it's been wonderful to be able to live in the city in such a diverse and welcoming um, town and um, to have them grow up, my two kids grow up um, in this DC area. And your daughter is going to go to college next year, so you're going to be she empty is nesters. Somewhere. I know we're going to be empty nesters. We've got and, to figure out what's next. Won't be at ASHG. I, you're really going to be unleashed. <laughs> Mona Unleashed. I think that's the that sounds like a really good uh, movie. This would be a great. Yeah, there you yeah. go. So, okay. So, uh, and when did you start? When did you start your family relative to your different jobs? Uh, boy, um, Lucas in 2003. So I was um, fairly er still with the after. center. Or no, I had left and was. Um, I did a little consulting to stay at home with my son for the first year and then headed to the Pew Charitable Trusts, right. which is actually where I got that first exposure to genomics and genetics. There was a fantastic program that the Pew um, Charitable Trusts had led for many years with Kathy Hudson as director, um, thinking about the intersection of uh, science and society uh, with an orientation, an explicit orientation from the Pew's, Pew Charitable Trust's perspective of how to positively integrate discovery um, into public life and to serve humanity, um, especially focused on some of the topics that have complicated um, uh, social um, and, and um, ethical questions. And so there was a portfolio of programs, Genetics and, and Public Policy Center, the um, uh, nanotechnology project, and then there had been a long time food and agricultural biotechnology portfolio, all of them trying to bring diverse uh, stakeholders and perspectives um, to a table to say, what are the challenges of this particular emerging technology? How do we work together to minimize harm, but really maximize benefit? Um, with so a, a very forward-leaning appreciation for science, acknowledging the challenges, um, but not letting those challenges um, uh, thwart the, you know, the full potential. But something happened in transitional because then you decided to go to a scientific professional society. I did. So first is, I guess, the Senior Director of Communications and Public Affairs of the Society for Neuroscience, and later you became the Deputy Executive Director for Program and Finance. Did they, did they recruit you? Did you say, hey, I want to get more deeply into a, a scientific society? What made that transition happen? Well, um, I, it was actually Marty Segesi, my old um, CEO, executive director, will tell you it was a total cold call email. Um, you to him or him to you? Uh, me to him. Oh. And um, I had been doing this work at Pew and the opportunity to bring communications and public affairs together um, into a single department was really exciting. And of course, neuroscience is, is second only to human genomics in terms of its um, excitement and potential. And but a distance so, second. Yeah, a, a distance a, second. Or, yeah. It's really a sub section, yeah, sub function yeah. of genomics, um, really. I mean, and that's a really- Sorry, they're meetings. That, 25,000 of them are meeting downtown. I should be careful about my words. It's a much, it's a much bigger society, right? Uh, it is a, a larger society, but I was, and I was really excited. I don't know if folks know a lot of places in Washington, the communications department is over there, the government relations department is over there, and you know, never the two shall speak. Um, or if they do, it's it's really sort of brokered. And it was really exciting to have um, SFN, which I, I, I have a special love for neuroscience and neurogenetics, um, that they brought these together, recognizing that it's really all on one continuum of being able to communicate to the public about the promise and potential of a particular um, research area. But that actually relates to one of the big initiatives you did there, because when you were there, you really were focused on increasing public awareness of neuroscience. Somehow you decided that was a priority and that you thought it was important to try to tackle the challenges of communicating complex concepts to the general public. Was that just something that was incubating in you for a long time and neuroscience was your, your, your well, it's area? it's fascinating. It is? You know, just as human genetics is fascinating. And um, there's a program there um, called the Brain Awareness Campaign. It's sort of like the DNA Day concept for genetics and genomics. And um, maybe it gets a little meta, um, but brain awareness is, is such a, uh, a, an important 
phenomena, it's an important concept um, for so much application to human benefit. I mean, if um, actually Nora Volkow, I will always remember, she was in the Washington Post being quoted saying, um, my brain wants chocolate. Not I want chocolate, my brain wants chocolate. And no, we, we always uh, say our DNA wants chocolate. Yeah, well, there you <laughs> Is it fully expressed I or so. only? It depends on the person. <laughs> okay. Um, and so um, I really found that to be um, sort of a, a, just a beautiful construct of this incredible organ that drives us, wakes us up, puts us to sleep, um, uh, compels us to eat chocolate, um, helps us love our, our friends and family and has evolved over um, millennia um, to protect us and to serve us and to help us evolve as a species. So and that gets a little, a little big picture, but it was really, um, for me, that click of why science is both uh, a beautiful thing for application, but also, you know, just in its own right, a, a beautiful pursuit. And it was while you were at the Society for Neuroscience that you first encountered this Sarah Bates person, right? Yes, I was just gonna say um, this, that all became possible because um, Ms. Sarah Bates um, appeared, uh, her resume first appeared and then blessedly she appeared full time um, to join us on the communications team at, at SFN. And she was a huge architect in actually creating what is uh, one manifestation of SFN's public communication, which is something called brainfacts.org. Um, SFN had always had something that we then refer, subsequently referred to as brainfacts.book, um, and it needed to enter the 21st century desperately. Um, and you and, were her supervisor? Uh, to, uh, she was in my, on my team. Was she a pain to <laughs> deal with? Um, she did, when, when we first met, I, she said, we need to redo the website. And um, I said, yes, I know, it's gonna take about 18 months, we're gonna do this and this. And she's like, 18 months? Um, I can't wait that long. Um, and so um, uh, we, she immediately jumped to really transforming um, our own communications operation. Um, did she used to leave place. her iPhone in strange places like on the podium? What? what? I was wondering where that was. Yeah, you left it on the podium. <laughs> So, okay. Um, so how big is the staff of the Neuroscience Society? Um, it, as I was heading out, about 110. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about this transition. You go yes. from there of a staff of 110, and you decide to get recruited, because I know there was an active recruitment to when you, they brought you to ASHG. How big is the staff of ASHG when you arrived? Uh, 19. Okay, so it's a, it was yep. a different kind of an organization. So. Yep. You obviously applied and you were interested, but what did, was that an easy recruitment? Was it, did they have you right away or did you have to think about it? Because that's a pretty big change. It, it was. Um, I think the, many of you have found circuitous career paths or maybe you knew immediately what you wanted to be when you were 16 or 17. Um, but the communications and public affairs work is what I had been doing but I had a really wonderful and supportive um, mentor and um, a, occasional um, uh, uh, bo bo boss who would kind of occasionally throw me in the deep end and say, you can do this. Um, and so I had the opportunity um, in, a, in a subsequent seven years or so to really grow my operational and organizational leadership capacity beyond communications and public affairs. Um, so associations, scientific societies, um, are fully fledged um, nonprofit organizations really of any size. And so in addition to the communications and public affairs work, I had the opportunity to learn about journals and meeting planning and um, budgets and staffing and HR. And you just really discover some people are just love communications and public affairs, but I loved putting it all together. Because the neuroscience and, that was all siloed, each of those things was done by a different, and now because right. it's smaller, you had to be involved with everything. Yes, and I had grown in my role at SFN to be a deputy executive director where I had learned yep. a lot of that capacity um, development because, you know, you can have the best intentions and mission and purpose, but if you can't operationalize it, if you can't make it happen through all of these different channels, um, then, then the full potential is, is, is unfulfilled. And so I had had that opportunity and um, uh, my 
executive director there was always very supportive of people being ready to take the next step. And when I saw the ASHG position, it really seemed like um, it really had everything I hoped uh, a CEO role would, would have, um, the exciting science and, um, and a wonderful staff team. My predecessor had really fostered a culture um, that, uh, that was fantastic to build on. And yet I really saw also that there was a lot of good work to do. Um, so it was very exciting and I was thrilled. And one of the first things that happened was I got an email from Eric welcoming me um, after I received the, um, the uh, position. And we made a plan to meet at some point soon. And we did. The rest is history. So when I reached out to some of the presidents that you've worked with, many of people commented how you truly transformed ASHG as an organization, making it more professional and more robust in many dimensions. One, I'll quote one of the comments from a former president was ASHG was largely a scientist led organization up until Mona's tenure. She was the first organizational professional to run it and it has made a world of difference. So first of all, is that, did, you know, when you arrived, did you realize that this doesn't, you know, did you, did, what was your initial feeling? Did you say like, all right, this is not a professional organization or did you just say, all right, this, I know what I'm gonna bring to this, but you weren't concerned about it? I just, what was that first feeling in the first couple of months? Um, well, there were, um, it was, it was, it was wonderful. So the staff was open and responsive. It did have a very genetic, uh, you know, specific um, emphasis and, and staff expertise and, and focus. I brought, a, I think, what's a complementary nonprofit um, management and association leadership kind of experience. And so the first couple of months were sort of getting to know one another and um, learning to speak one another's language. Um, one of my former colleagues who's since retired said, we're all learning to speak Mona, but it's taking <laughs> a little bit of time because you have all of these words that we don't use. Um, and, and that's okay. Um, and so it was starting that process of holding on to um, all the expertise that, that um, genetics and genomics um, uh, Expertise, you know, experience brought, but also starting to introduce these other organizational um, components. And um, I think one of the things that uh, I, I have brought that is new is one of the great things about scientific societies is we have amazing volunteers, um, some of many of whom I see in the room, who um, bring that genetics and genomics expertise. And so uh, you know, if you can, you can, you can get the best of both worlds. You can get association and nonprofit leadership expertise and, and annual meeting expertise and policy and legislative expertise. And then we have this wonderful richness of volunteers who bring the genetics and genomics expertise. And so we started to really draw more on the, um, the needs and perspectives of the field rather than presuming or nobody presumed, but rather than trying to architect that ourselves. And I, I do think having a, a non-geneticist is a little, bit of, a little bit of an honest broker because you don't, I don't have a particular research area that I think is more important or, and so you could bring this collective group of experts from so many different um, uh, facets of genetics and genomics and say, okay, you know, how are we gonna um, reach consensus and, and um, uh, move a, a subject um, component forward. What, what I noticed is that uh, there was no, no moment in time where you feel like you were making radical changes. As my observation as a, as a society member, as somebody interacts, it was like slow changes over time. Then all of a sudden a, a year would go by, I go, wow, it feels different. And two years, wow, it's very different. Three years, it's incredibly different. And yet it wasn't feeling like you were ripping the drywall down and the, you, know, you were sort of undergoing a renovation. I think it was just my observation was these slow incremental improvements that made it more professional, which is where it is now. Before we go into a little bit more of the, those programming, one thing I'm curious about the science, as somebody who just came into the genetics genomics realm, what's the top thing that has surprised you about our field that coming in, you had no idea you were gonna either be exposed to or that we were capable of? What, what, coming from neuroscience and all of a sudden sure. six years later in genetics and genomics, what's the thing that has surprised you or impressed you the most? Um, 
I'd say a couple of things. Um, certainly, the, the this, my experience has, has co uh, coincided with just the, the incredible expansion of computational um, uh, tools and, and research across the board. That was starting to be the case in um, neuroscience, but you know, is just so exponentially greater um, in the genomics and genetic space. Um, I think the incredible willingness to share actually the expectation to share um, data and, and feedback um, uh, is special here. This community is, is, a, is a particularly open one. Um, and I think the, for me, the big expansion and growth experience was um, the, I had really come from a biomedical research health application standpoint and about three or four weeks into my tenure um, we had the tragedy of the um, Charlottesville riots and I had really just started and was kind of still finding the coffee um, and obviously this was so um, we started getting calls about um, you know the the genetic and genomic um, underpinnings of hate and honestly, I really hadn't, um, it, it just, it opened this whole nother wing of the genetics and genomics um, import. Um, and it's been a journey for me to understand and see how early this community started to integrate questions around social, ethical, legal um, considerations into the research agenda. Um, and so I've had to get um, really deepen my capacity, my understanding to facilitate this great potential um, and scientific uh, promise and, and, and health promise alongside, you know, these, these questions that you all have grappled with for a long time and how to, how to do that in a way that still speaks to the promise and advocates for the investment um, in, in the research agenda. So that relates to what might arguably be one of the big challenges you had with, with um, moving forward on the eugenics front. So facing our history project, which ASHG took on, was one of the most impactful and probably one of the most initi difficult initiatives that have been shepherded under your watch from beginning to end. Maybe you could tell the NHRI family, for those who don't know, what is the Facing Our History project and what are your thoughts on looking back on what it's accomplished or what you hope its impact's going to be in the future? Sure. Um, well, first, I, I just want to say from the outset that none of this would have been possible without expert um, guidance and direction and leadership from um, Dr. Chasman Jackson, who joined us as Senior Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the summer of 2020, and Neil Hanchard, um, who I think I see over there, um, who was, um, a, my, was a board member as I was, I was coming aboard. Um, but in the in 2020, the, you know, in the, in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the um, uh, social justice and, and uh, movements and, and uh, demands, understandable, um, of that summer, the board really took a hard look at itself and said, it's probably overdue, um, but we need to acknowledge um, the roots of our um, of some, some of the roots of the society, many of which I didn't fully understand at the time, um, but they charged us to undertake um, a project. Um, that, of course, you all and the history initiatives and work that you do is much larger than we could have tackled um, as an organization, but the board felt very strongly that this was um, uh, a, a significant and essential undertaking. I should add Charmaine Royal, who was also on the board and a, and a major um, uh, encourager of, of this work. Um, and so we talked a lot as an organization about how to approach this. Um, I was mindful, actually, as of, this is a quick aside, as of 2018, I was doing my math and I was like, oh, the 75th anniversary is right around the corner. Of and, your society. Of, the, of ASHG, yes. sorry. And, um, so there was um, some, you know, deep temporal relevance and um, to it as well. Um, and so the board really wrestled with what could ASHG do as an organization? What was our particular role? Um, how could we um, talk about uh, and document some of those early harms? And how could we talk about progress without um, uh, get, without 
trying to push away the, the, the difficult parts. And so um, the organization pulled together a group, really a wide ranging group, including some who had been longtime ASHG leaders, as well as some um, voices who were human geneticists, um, but had not felt as included in the society, um, who had diverse perspectives um, on and really maybe felt unwelcome at ASHG in part because we hadn't acknowledged and talked about some of these roots. Um, and so over the course of a year, this group met periodically um, to provide feedback on, on a report and guide it. And, and um, Neil was the, um, I think we avoided chair. I think he was the facilitator. Um, thank you for the, um, for the process, which the board then accepted the report and, and reflected on and issued a, a, a very important statement um, apologizing for that role, which, um, and, and its early um, contributions and interwoven relationships with the U American Eugenics Society and also talked about some of um, the work that it would have underway, you know, in the future. And it, and it was an important, just an essential way, I think, to start the 75th anniversary, um, not with celebration, but with reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, no doubt, a lot more work to do and acknowledging a lot more work to do, um, which also, uh, I hope, um, started to, uh, meaningfully also interweave um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion as a, as a priority for the organization. It had already become more important, um, but it added a, um, a, an essential component to that. And I know work. DEI is a huge priority for you. As you walk out the door of ASHG, are, are you pleased with the trajectory you're leaving it on with respect to those efforts? I, there's so much to do. Right. Um, the, I've come to a really appreciate, maybe thanks to Charles and, and so many others, that the H in our name is such a blessing and such a challenge because diversity is in the, written into the genome, right? And so every, how we characterize our own aspects of diversity may or may not be genetically relevant, actually, um, but, um, but are certainly part of our identity in that interplay is um, has a lot of work to do um, and I am not um, it's not my area of expertise I've tried to listen as well as I could and to be a good steward um, and I'm sure the next generation of ASHG leaders will work with the next generation of NHGRI leaders to to shape that for the future one thing that I do think we've done in large part thank you um, to um, uh, folks like Terry and to Vance, who helped us start the Human Genome, uh, the Human Genetic Scholars Initiative, is begin to change um, our community. Uh, ASHG is a little organization compared to human genetics, um, but we are stewards of this incredible community. Many of you may have been able to join us at the meeting in DC a few weeks ago. And we have one thing that we can do is start to change the the composition, the, cult, the, the, the culture, the presence of that community so that people know that their scholarship, their um, person, their um, communities uh, are seen and heard in the, in the field. And so I, I think the meeting's doing that more actively, the membership striving to do that, the leadership is certainly more diverse. Um, and I feel really confident the journals are doing a lot more in this space that, um, working together that will continue. This may relate to the next question I want to ask, which now having been at two very prominent, well-respected societies, neuroscience and, and, and ASHG, do you think the role of scientific societies are, have changed and are continuing to change what their role in the scientific ecosystem is? I mean, I think it certainly has in the area of diversity, for example, yeah. is, but do you think in other domains as well? So we could have a whole conversation about, you know, the, the changing dynamics of scientific societies um, we face as an organization, changes in the journal um, uh, environment. We wondered for a little bit if annual meetings were gonna be a right. thing of the past for about 15 minutes in 2020. Everybody was like, let's never have another meeting again. We can always meet online. Um, but I think we all realized that that wasn't um, uh, really consistent with the with the H um, either. Um, we need to see one another and be with one another. 
So scientific societies are changing. Um, membership trends are changing. I know many of our longer standing members would say, my PI just told me I have to join ASHG, and so that's what I do um, because I'm, that's my community. And as human genetics has, has moved out beyond um, a core human genetics community across all of science, and that creates new opportunities. So I think scientific societies are rele as relevant as ever. I hope um, you all see a sense of um, uh, the, the value of having some organization out there um, in your corner and, and working for you and trying to move your science forward and um, collectively being a, a home. Um, but we're all um, uh, trying to respond to current times just as, as um, all organizations are. And, and you didn't even mention scientific publishing, which when societies have a journal, that's a whole other conversation of complexity. So you served, I mean, now I want to talk a little bit about people that you have really interacted a lot with. I thought it was interesting. I was going back last night through the president's, because the partnership between the president and the CEO at ASAG is a very special one. It's a, it's a one year fling and it's, uh, you know, super intense uh, interactions. Um, and, but it's really, really important and it needs to be really good um, collaborative interactions. So I guess, Nancy Cox was the year, sort of your transitional year yep. or the year before? She hired me. She hired you formally. And yep. then I want to point out the interaction or the, the, the synergies between the people you've worked with in this institute. So Nancy is a former member of our Board of Scientific Council, a current member of our, our advisory council. And then you had David Nelson for a year, a good friend yep. of the institute, done a lot for us over the years. Then you had to serve with this guy, Les Biesecker, as the president. There was that, there was that guy. And then the next year was Tony Winship Boris, and Tony came to the Institute as a tenure track investigator in 1993 or That's so. A roommate for, with Les, right? You guys yeah. had an well, office together. Right. So Tony grew up here and got tenured here and then got recruited elsewhere. So it was a bit, a bit close ties. And then, then the next president was Gal Jarvik, a current member of our advisory council. Then there was this guy, Charles Rotimi, who you worked with for a year, who you worked very closely with. And then most recently was Brendan Lee, who was formerly the chair of our Board of Scientific Counselors and another good friend of the Institute. And, and then next year, well, you won't be here anymore, but it'll be Bruce Gelb, and you worked with him on the on-deck batter kind of thing as the incoming president, and Bruce, a good friend, another good friend of the Institute. So out of that list, and don't have to show any biases, who was your favorite? <laughs> I mean... Two of them are in the audience. It was really Brendan. I thought it was Brendan. And, and were there any clunkers? Were there any of those that you would have said, oh God, not Les Biesecker again? Nothing like that? No. No. They, you really, they, these are terrific folks. So they I think you're gonna say every folks. one of them was a joy with maybe one exception. But, so yeah. I, I, always, I always have to thank the nominating committee for its wisdom and yeah. in, in putting forward, you know, outstanding leaders from very different fields. You know, the, the, this is such a diverse group. Um, that they work hard to make sure that over time um, the leadership represents different facets um, of the field and different areas of expertise. And um, from my neuroscience days, you know, um, you have to have high brain plasticity to have a new president every year, got to be ready to adapt, um, but also to learn. And so each one of those presidents gave me a completely new facet of the field that um, I hope I held on to, you know, successively year over year um, to just become a little bit uh, more um, uh, experienced and able to, to represent the, the array of, of genomics knowledge. Um, Les's um, real discussions with me about genetic ex exceptionalism um, and uh, in all of its facets and complications of, you know, what does it mean for uh, everything from health tests and data access to concepts around the social constructs that, um, uh, and, and belief structures that really aren't accurate um, is just one example. And, and of course, um, Charles has been such an advocate for global dialogue and the, um, the common ancestry and evolution that we share. And what I notice is that even for me, and especially now with the new fellowship program, we're even structurally putting some things in place where when that new president arrives, they're obviously going to work very closely with your successor. 
but I regard them as a partner for me because there's a number of things we interact with. Well, I interact with the board, but now through the fellowship program, we'll have some joint responsibilities. And I look forward to that as well. I mean, because there's always this consistent legacy of great presidents. And they work through. really well together too. Yes. We work hard to create sort of a presidential suite um, and usually they have quite different backgrounds, and, and, but they're working together uh, for the organization's benefit. So I'm going to ask like one more question. So if people have questions for Mona, if you can start just sort of going up to the microphone, um, that will give you your opportunity in about a minute. If there's anybody online that has questions, Susan's going to tell me that. So I was also thinking about, in addition to Les and Charles, people that you've, and you've mentioned a bunch of others. I mean, you really know a lot of people at this institute because of other people who have served on your board. Chris Gunter is a board member right now. I think Elaine Ostrander was recently a board member. I don't know if it was before your time I or think not. it was before my time. What about, was Bill Gall on when you were on or was that before your time? Pre-me. Neil but was I on, but Neil was, Neil on, was on, on at the time. Obviously you interact a lot with me and Vince and Ellen Rolfes, Christina. Capitzi, Sarah, we already mentioned. Francis, you interact with. Terry, you interact with. So I mean, there's probably others that I can't think of around the board that I may have missed, but there's a lot of people that you've utilized. So here's my question before we go to audience questions, is that which out of all those NHGRI people that you've met, you've interacted with, if you could have a one-on-one -on -one dinner with, who would, that, would, that could include me, um, who, who would you want to have dinner with out of those? And then importantly, who would you not want to have a dinner with? Okay, you're not gonna answer that one, all right. So, what, what was that? I'm an excellent cook. Oh, Christina's <laughs> advocating she cooks well. I can cook a little, so we could have that. So if people would queue up, uh, just, if anybody have questions for Mona, we're gonna go about another five minutes, and I know, are there anybody online? I know, and I'm getting the watch sign, which means you don't want anybody else asking questions. No, we're gonna have, there was some, I thought that was somebody going for a question, no? Any, I think Terry's gonna ask one. We'll take one or two questions one and then we will. So, yeah. hey Mona, it's great, great to see you. Um, so I'm a little curious about the relationship between the society and the journal. So, so how do you keep those, I mean, they have to be integrated and yet separate and unbiased, et cetera. So sure. could you talk about that a bit? Sure. Um, so yes, editorial independence is a foundation of um, our relationship with the journals. The uh, they are owned by the society, but they are granted uh, as a founding precept of having editorial independence. And so um, the society identifies the editor-in-chief. Um, we went through a, a search process, uh, in particular while I was here, um, to identify Mike Bombshad for the Human Genetics and Genomics Advances launch. Um, and that has um, those, so that is a relationship. So you are identifying, soliciting nominations for the editor in chief and selecting the editor, but then really granting independence in terms of the content. Um, we have good relations um, via a staff position of, are there opportunities for, for instance, the history future initiative was published in the journal. Um, in many ways, the journal is the scientific record of yeah. this field, or one of them, one of the prominent ones. And so, um, you know, creating opportunities of, would this be of interest? Um, and we have used the, the journals um, with the editor's agreement for um, publishing ASHG perspectives and, and other ASHG content. Um, but the independence is uh, significant, and we take um, great care not to be um, aware of necessarily anything in the pipeline, unless it's you know helpful for us to be able to promote or share, but no editorial input. We're going to take two more questions: one from Sarah, then one from online. So Sarah, oh maybe three. We're going to let Christina. All right, we'll sneak Christina. That's good because she's going to tell us what she's going to cook for dinner. Go ahead. Boy, that's going to be hard to uh, top. So uh, yes, thank you, Mona. Um, so my question is, could you speak to what you see as the role of geneticists and genomicists in the next few years in an advocacy sort of role, um, especially in the current uh, climate with misinformation? Sure. Well, um, the it's a it's a great question, and advocacy um, combines communication and, and um, presentation of amazing um, uh, informa information that's emerging from the field, as well as those social harms that the society and, and the larger community is dedicated to thwarting. I 
I won't profess here to have the answer for the larger anti-science misinformation efforts that are really calculated, large scale, and big challenges for society, lowercase s, not capital S, society. Um, but obviously we all play a role in it. And so the society itself has committed to speaking out when genetics is misused for harms. Um, and that's really just one voice, an important voice, but one voice. And what I do hope we can do, and I know the society is committed to moving forward, is helping to um, train and empower individual scientists to speak up either collectively in pursuit of a shared concern or individually. I mean, it's a great thing that there are 8,000 ASHG members who have particular interests, expertise, passions that um, you all want to give voice to. And so how can we help you do that better? Um, and at least as a small contribution, we have launched the, we're, in, we're soon to be recruiting for our third class of ACGT, Amer um, Advocacy Certificates for Genetics Trainees, um, which is a year-long program for about a dozen early stage researchers, um, giving them the tools and the experience to advocate. And what does that look like? We do it in the context of the NIH budget um, because that is a major policy priority for ASHG to support you all, encourage funding. Um, so they learn how to write op-eds, short policy papers, how to go to the Hill, elevator speeches, um, and how to speak out um, in their local districts or make, you know, go to your local office, your uh, state office or, or congressional office um, to make your views known. And so that's really the superpower of a society, which is to be able to empower each of you to be passionate about the things you're passionate about while we can... Um, uh, you know, really advocate for the, for the field broadly. Christina? I had a similar question to Sarah. So on the climate of misinformation, and Sarah's, uh, the OC presentation yesterday, they stated that as NIH under HHS, we aren't allowed to re respond to, you know, direct scientific attacks and mis misinformation. That's the, am I correct? That's the sort of the, the, in the agency line. So what, um, Knowing that, how does your society how, was it help combat misinformation? What is the best, what have you seen as the best technique, I guess, in general? So broader question. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, we rely a lot on the nonpartisan research and analysis and public communication that our friends can promote the NIH um, resources that are out there that are talking about the advances and, the, um, and the, the progress and the factual information about science. Um, I will say we are one small actor in a very large uh, society community that is working for NIH. Um, and so we meet as um, a, a really large NIH advocacy community. Um, and work with key leaders like Research America, Ad Hoc Group for Medical Research, and others to unite our voices in support of the importance of science. Um, and we do that primarily to the legislative um, uh, community. Um, the general public, uh, the challenges of the general public from a science literacy standpoint to, uh, um, a and the challenges in the larger um, societal um, uh, persuasion efforts are really kind of a worst case, uh, are really um, combining to cause, I think, significant challenges that no one organization alone is going to um, address. And I don't want to end it on a, on a, on a bummer note because um, it's really important that, I guess I'm going to go back to my neuroscience, that we, we keep the prefrontal cortex engaged um, and there's a lot of pressure um, to be afraid and to be fearful and to not believe and to kind of pull ourselves back into that, um, uh, into the, the um, reactive fear flight, um, uh, fight or flight kind of mode. And so I think the information you're putting out, the information we continue to put out, the advocacy that we do um, is so important and it's more important than ever. And it, and it um, I should say, it's super important because although there is misinformation, 
we tend to focus on that. The public is with biomedical research. And, and scientists are trained to focus on you know, the problem. But way back when, in 2019, you know, we did a public opinion survey. It's just a public opinion survey. It's not a scientific research program. But the public was curious about human genetics and genomics research. They were hopeful. They were excited. And they still believe that this is the National Institutes of Hope. And so I hope that what you'll take away is that the work you do is really important. The public is with us, despite the challenges. Um, and to get up every day to keep doing the research that you're doing, because I know that that's what mo motivates you, and that's what's going to create long-term change. So misinformation is an issue, um, but let's also focus on the, the, um, the very strong support that the public continues to have and patients continue to have for the research that you're doing. Well, Mona, what I, would, what I want to end with is saying that, like I said in my remarks earlier, I, I thought this would be like halftime for your run as CEO. So I'm, it's still, I'm still sad you're leaving. I feel like this could be halftime in our conversation. I could go on another hour talking to you, and I'm sure lots of other questions we're leaving behind, including some on Zoom. Our time just doesn't allow us to do it. But I'm delighted you came here today. I'm delighted I got a chance to honor you. Um, I'm delighted that my NHRI family has gotten to know you a little bit more uh, and, and have come to adore you the way the people that, from NHRI that have interacted with you so much over the last six years already feel that way. I'm glad you brought part of your family to share with us today. Hopefully they had enjoyed hearing this and don't feel I was too mean to her at all. <laughs> but also can sort of to see the, the, the genuine um, friendship and collaboration that exists between our, we're going to miss you. I, but on the other hand, I am ex exceedingly confident that ASHE will be, continue to be in good hands because of the standard that you have set. I know the search committee is sitting there working, saying we've got to get someone at least as good as Mona. It's a high bar. I think they'll do it. And, uh, but you've put them on a trajectory that I think is incredibly valuable, and we have all benefited from that and will continue to benefit for years to come. So thank you so much. Thank you. Could I? Yeah. Go ahead. I just want to offer that um, this partnership is not a given um, in any, as you said, many societies um, have, you know, solid and important relationships with, um, with their Institute or Center. Um, and I just want to thank you for um, the openness and receptivity and encouragement that you've given for your leadership to be involved with the society because, uh, you know, this really has to be a two-way street. Um, and I, um, you can see today the impact that you have on um, building a strong staff team. And none of what we talked about today would have been possible without the now 33 um, staff at Rockville um, who have made this possible and, and grown this operation right alongside me. So it would not be a full meeting if I didn't thank them, um, just as you've recognized and thanked your Absolutely. team here. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.